verse 42, the thief said unto Jesus, the repented thief, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And we spoke of that last time. The Lord's got to come. He has to go and He has to come. Verse 43, today, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Dear Holy God, help us understand Your Word today. Help us, God, to to be committed, dear Father, to Your ways, Your house, Your truth. And God, we just want to thank You for our salvation, for this good report in regard to this thief. And we thank You for Your grace and for Your dying on the cross that You sent Your Son and gave Him as a gift to the world that we might be saved. Help us understand Thy Word. Help us rejoice. Walk by faith. Not lose hope. You're worthy, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the cults, such as the Watchtower Organization, the Seventh-day Adventists, and many others, who believe that you die and your spirit somehow or another dies with your body or sits there and sleeps with your body or whatever it might be, uh, they have a problem with this verse because it says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Well, his body's not going to be with him today. So, if his body's not going to be with Jesus today, uh, his body's going to be buried somewhere. Um, how can he be with Jesus in paradise? Not there in the garden somewhere, but in paradise. Uh, the way they deal with this verse is to rewrite the Bible. They move the comma. So, instead of saying, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, they make it to where Jesus says, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so, I believe the thief already knew that Jesus was talking to him that day. And uh, so, let's stick with our Bible. Because what the cults are going to do, and the heretics, they're, gonna, they're going to move around commas. They're, they're going to change the wording. They're going to call things parables that are not parables. They're going to do whatever they can do to teach their particular doctrine. And uh, this is just wrong. And uh, we need to ask today, though, the title of my message is The Transportable Garden. And uh, we're going to ask, what did Jesus mean by paradise? What did He mean by paradise? First of all, we know that the body of Jesus did not resurrect until the first day of the week before sunrise. So his statement about today being in paradise had to, uh, to be in relation to his ghost or his spirit, his soul. His body was going to remain in the tomb. So it was not going to be in paradise that day. So he's talking about his soul. So we must believe that the spirit of Jesus was three days and three nights in a place called paradise. And his body was three days and three nights in the tomb in the earth. Notice Matthew 27, when Joseph had taken the body, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. Hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. All right, so the Lord's body that day was laid in the tomb. The Lord's Spirit left His body when He gave up the ghost and it went to a place called Paradise where the thief who died that same day also went in his soul. 
But Matthew 12, the Lord prophesied that He will be in the heart of the earth the same amount of time that Jonah was in the belly of the well. Look at Matthew 12. Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Bible scholars are divided on whether the phrase heart of the earth is talking about the tomb or is talking about the underworld far below the tomb. Uh, Gabeline, in his Gospel of Matthew, on this verse says, Jonah, after his death and resurrection experience, proclaimed the message of God. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so was Jesus to be the same length of time in the grave. So he shows that the verse here in Matthew 12 is dealing with the time period that the Lord's body is going to be in the grave. And the Lord's not really discussing where His Spirit is going to go. Now, I used to apply the Lord's statement about the heart of the earth to His Spirit. I now believe in context that it refers to His body in the tomb. Um, the body of Jesus was three days and three nights in the tomb. If He was crucified on Thursday and He was buried before 6 p.m., that means His body was in the tomb before the, the date changed. And it means that He had part of that day, and in Jewish reckoning, and the biblical reckoning, a part of the day is considered for the day. Uh, his body would be in the grave Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Uh, his body would be in the grave part of Thursday, part of Friday, and Saturday. I'm sorry, part of Thursday, all of Friday, and all of Saturday. Jesus was taken down from the cross about 3 p.m. on Thursday, which is considered the evening. Remember, when the Bible uses the phrase evening, sometimes it means 3 p.m. and sometimes it means 6 o'clock when the date changes. Uh, but the Lord was buried before 6 p.m. on Thursday. So His body was in the tomb, in the heart of the earth, uh, three days and three nights. And here's something you need to realize. Joseph did not have far to go. When he took his body off the cross, uh, it was only a little ways to where his sepulcher was because it was in the same place. Look at John 19. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So they needed to get him in the grave and get all that done before the date change, before 6 p.m., you see. So Jesus was in the tomb, in his body, three days and three nights. Now, ultimately, the teaching is the same. Whether or not Jesus was in the heart of the earth with his spirit three days and three nights, or whether his body was in the heart of the earth, the tomb three days and three nights. The teaching is the same. Uh, because I believe the Lord did go in His Spirit to the heart of the earth. The question is simply, what does that particular verse mean? His grave was a tomb that was cut out of the rock. But His Spirit was in the heart of the earth, deeper below, in a place called paradise. Why should we hold that the Lord's statement in Matthew 12 refers to the tomb rather than paradise? If you, re if you look at the analogy... The experience is Jonah. And the Lord says that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so would he be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But Jonah's body was three days and three nights in the well's belly, not his spirit. Jonah's spirit was not three days and three nights in the well's belly. It was in hell. Jonah 2, he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Jonah died, his spirit woke up in hell, and his body was dead inside the well's belly. And uh, when Jonah cried to the Lord, the Lord heard him, he repented, and he brought him out of hell, brought his spirit back to his body, and then the, Jonah was there in the belly of the well and was resurrected. Now listen. Our Lord's Spirit did not have to suffer in hell. That's a heretical doctrine. The Lord told the thief that that very day He would be with him in paradise. And paradise is a place of comfort. 
But as Jonah's body remained in the well after he died, so would the Lord's body remain in the tomb after he died. But again, Jonah's spirit was not three days and three nights in the well. Now, few will confess that Jonah's spirit went temporarily to hell. They all suddenly become uh, watchtower interpreters. And uh, they start telling us that hell there in Jonah is figurative. And uh, they say, well, you know, he's using that figuratively. Well, that's going to cause a big problem when you get to the New Testament, isn't it? Because then you could just start saying that all these other warnings about hell are figurative. Uh, I mean, when are you going to believe the Bible? See, that's the question. You will say, well, it just seems to me that uh, that's hard for me to believe. Well, it doesn't matter what's hard for you to believe. It's hard to believe that anybody was swallowed by well to begin with. So, so we've got to get rid of that nonsense and understand when God tells you something, uh, we need to believe it. Now, many great interpreters in history do say that Jonah died uh, in the belly of the well. So they must confess that Jonah's spirit was not in the well's belly for three days and three nights. They might say that his spirit went down to paradise. They might say it went up to heaven. Uh, the Bible says it was in hell. But my point is, if Jonah died, as a lot of interpreters believe throughout history, then uh, it could not have remained in the well. Which means when Jesus says that Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, he's talking about the, the, the body of Jonah. So shall my body be three days and three nights. And this protects us from the idea that the Lord's body did not resurrect, which was a Gnostic teaching. The Lord's talking about His body, and it's saying my body's going to be in that tomb three days and three nights, and it's going to resurrect in three days and three nights. So, he doesn't in that verse tell us where his spirit's going to be. Uh, I therefore hold that the Lord is discussing the resurrection of his body out of the tomb in Matthew 12. And by the heart of the earth, he's referring to the tomb. Can the grave or tomb be described as the heart of the earth? I want you to notice the grave is always seen to be down in the Bible. Job 21, there's plenty of verses like this, but they spend their days in wealth and in a moment go what? down to the grave. Yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. So the grave is always down, you see. Uh, was the Lord Jesus' tomb down? Well, it was cut out of rock in, in, in the earth. And I believe it was in the heart of the earth. Uh, Luke 24 says, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher and what? Stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes. John 20, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. So I believe that these verses are teaching us that the Lord's tomb was cut. It was like a cave cut out of a rock, but it was probably dug down. You probably had to walk down a little ways as you went down into the chamber. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says the Lord was buried. Do you understand that? He was buried. So I believe, and, and, and he rose again. He rose up out of that tomb. So, my point to you today is simply this. The Lord's body was in the heart of the earth, which was the tomb. It would stay there three days and three nights. Now we need to ask, where did his soul go? And uh, I believe his soul also went into the heart of the earth, but far lower than just the tomb. I believe his soul went way down into the regions of, that are in the center of the earth, far below the tomb. I just think we need to prove it with another scripture other than Matthew 12. Uh, and so let me show you some scriptures. Acts 2, talking about David, he seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, meaning David is prophesying over there in Psalm 16, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither... Notice that word neither. That's a pretty important word, isn't it? It means that what he's about to tell you now is not what he was talking about just then. So, David says the Lord's soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Well, that's about as plain as you can get. The flesh did not see corruption. He didn't say his soul did not go to hell. He said what? It was not left in hell. Now, because some people throughout history only see hell in a very limited viewpoint. When they see hell, they think that it always has to be a place burning with fire. 
But hell means the underworld. Hell means under. Do you understand that? The heel of your shoe is called the heel because it's under. Do you see that? Helmet. Your head is under the, the, the helmet. Anything with hell in it usually means under. Hell means the underworld. Now, hell happened to be a very big, complicated place. And there was, according to the Bible, a good side of hell. So, the good side of hell was where good people went that believed on the Lord or whatever. The bad side of hell is where the bad folks went. And um, so, because I'm teaching you that the soul of Jesus went to hell, you should not make the conclusion or the jump in understanding that that meant Jesus went down to suffer in hell. No, when the Lord said on the cross, it is finished, guess what? He meant it's finished. He doesn't have to go down and be, and be tormented down in hell. That's heresy. The Lord accomplished all over the place in the Bible. When you see Paul and Peter and the other apostles talking about Jesus, it says that He died on the cross. It was by His stripes we are healed. Over and over and over it talks about the cross. Bearing our sins in His body on the tree. It never says bearing our sins in His body in hell. Or bearing our sins in His spirit in hell. That's not true. That's not right. So, what we see now is simply this. The body of Jesus was in the heart of the earth, the tomb. The soul of Jesus was deep down in the heart of the earth in hell. But He was not suffering in hell. He was comforting the good saints that were on the good side of hell. I can title my message today, The Good Side of Hell. But people might believe that there's still a good side down there. And uh, there's not a good side down there anymore. And we'll get to that in a second. What did Jesus say? Jesus said to the thief that the thief would be with him when? Today. During the three and a half, uh, during these three days and three nights, he would be with Jesus in a place called paradise. Now, how in the world can this be? How can his soul be in paradise and also be in hell? It must mean that paradise is a compartment of hell. And that hell is a generic world, meaning underworld, underworld, down there, the hell. And this is proven by the Lord Himself in Luke 16. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, it's a myth, a fable, a fantasy that Abraham's bosom is a place. Abraham's bosom means what? Abraham's bosom. Abraham's going to talk here in a second. This is Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. So the beggar and the rich man, their bodies are in the grave. However, somewhere, wherever Abraham was, the beggar's spirit was resting in Abraham's spirit. And you say, but it says he has a bosom. Well, that's last uh, week's sermon where we talked about the, the, the soul body that's in your body uh, today. But notice, in hell, the rich man, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, where is the rich man in his spirit? Tormented in what? Hell. But he looks up in hell and sees Abraham and the beggar Lazarus in his bosom and they are comforted. That meant that wherever Abraham was and wherever Lazarus was, he had to be down in the heart of the earth where hell is. That's why it says that Jesus' soul was not left in hell because He was down there in paradise. See. Now, there's some teachers that can't understand how the center of the earth could be so complicated. And so what they try to say is, well, maybe the rich man was looking up. 
he lifted up his eyes and maybe he looked up into heaven and saw Lazarus. But what I say to that is, no, it doesn't say that he looked up to heaven. It says he lifted up his eyes. And scores of times, that phrase in the Bible, unless it has the additional phrase, he lifted up his eyes unto heaven, if you lift up your eyes, you're always looking horizontally. Look at uh, Luke 6. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples. Was he looking up in the clouds? No. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So, it always means to look out horizontally. So, when that rich man died and woke up in hell in his spirit, and he opened up his spirit eyes and lifted up his spirit eyes, he was looking horizontally. There was a gulf between the good side of hell and the bad side of hell. And nobody could cross over. The folks in the good side of hell could not get over, which they're in paradise. They could not get over to the bad side of hell, even if they wanted to. Hell's a bottomless pit. You just can't get over there. God has separated it by a gulf, see. So let's sum up some things today. Well, number one, we know that Jesus and the good thief went to paradise that same day in their souls. Number two, we know that the Bible teaches that the soul of Jesus went to hell. Number three, we know that Jesus revealed to us in the story of the rich man and Lazarus that the underworld had two compartments. Therefore, we conclude, hell had a tormenting side and a what? A comforting side. I don't believe Samuel went to the bad side of hell. Do you? It says in 1 Samuel 28, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Alright? They didn't bring up his body. They brought up his spirit. But his spirit did not come down out of heaven. When they brought up Samuel's ghost, uh, his spirit, they brought it up. So, unless he was down there suffering in hell, they brought up his spirit from the paradise side of hell that was down in the underworld. Now, the conclusion is this. Paradise at the time of Christ and in the Old Testament was where? Down in the heart of the earth where hell is. But after Christ's resurrection, it is now seen to be up in heaven. That's why I'm telling you the title of my message is a transportable garden. God's able to move paradise. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the moon is. The third heaven is up beyond that, due north, up there somewhere called the third heaven. It means beyond outer space. That's where God's heaven is. Now, Paul says, I don't know if I was in my body and raptured up there or if I was out of my body. I don't know. But all I know is I went up there. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into what? Paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So, it appears that paradise is now up when before it was down because we know the Lord's soul went to hell and we know He said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise and we know all these scriptures that talk about them being down and coming up and etc. So, putting all that together, paradise before the Lord's resurrection was down. Paradise after the Lord's resurrection was up. This is a traditional teaching among dispensational premillennialists. The Schofield notes tell us, if you had a Schofield Bible, paradise, therefore, is now in the immediate presence of God. It is believed that Ephesians 4, 
when he uh, takes cap- captivity captive, indicates the time of the change. Clarence Larkin in his book in 1918 called Dispensational Truth says, Paradise, the abode of the souls of the righteous dead until Christ's resurrection. It is now empty. So, it's a traditional teaching and I believe it's a correct teaching that there was a region in the underworld that was a garden, it was a comforting place and this thing has now been emptied and uh, we see now that it has been taken to heaven now that the Lord has paid for the sins of the human race. Now, there's an interesting verse in Revelation 2. He that hath an ear, says Jesus, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise is up in heaven now. It was in the underworld into Christ's resurrection. But we're told that the tree of life is in paradise. Now, let's ask a question. Where was the tree of life in the book of Genesis? It was in the what? The garden. On earth. Genesis 2, the Lord God planted a what? A garden. Eastward in Eden. What's Eden? It's a city. The city of Eden. And there is a garden in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now notice, our Lord says that there's a tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Genesis tells us that the tree of life is in the midst of the garden of God. Well, guess what the word paradise means? It means garden. So the etymology of the word paradise means garden. Wikipedia tells us its original meaning was a walled-in compound or garden. Uh, Oxford tells us in modern Persian, Aramaic, for deus means garden or paradise. Used in Greek, first by Xenophon, for a Persian enclosed part. It's an orchard, a pleasure ground. It was used in the Septuagint for the Garden of Eden. So instead of God planted a garden, in uh, the Septuagint they put, He made paradise. It's the same word, the same type of teaching. Now, We've already seen that the tree of life was growing in this garden. And Jesus says the tree of life is in paradise. So, my point is simply this. Paradise, the paradise of God, is the same as the garden of God. And we can simply trace this beautiful garden throughout the Scriptures. God made the garden with the tree of life on earth in the book of Genesis. That's where it remained. When Adam was kicked out of that garden, he was kicked out of paradise. And the cherubim with the flaming sword barred the entrance to the paradise. Now, we do not know how long it remained on earth. But at some point in time, something happened. You can't go over there and and try to find paradise now. You can't go try to find the garden. It's not there anymore. Something happened. Now, I'm going to show you what I believe happened. Let's sum this up. The garden of God, or paradise, with the tree of life, was one originally on the earth in the city of of Eden. Two, it was then moved below to the underworld, out of the reach of man. And there's a strange passage in Ezekiel 31 that's prophesying against Egypt, but at the same time seems to give you this 
this, this double reference and almost gives you history. You know, like when the Bible is warning the king of Babylon and then it gives you this history of Lucifer's fall, the Bible is able to give you a historical ancient reality while at the same time dealing the current setting with a prophecy. Now notice what it tells us in Ezekiel 31. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. So what did God do to the garden? He moved it down. Now, that doesn't mean that this Pharaoh is going to be on the good side where the paradise is. He might end up on the bad side where the hell is, like the rich man did in Luke 16. But I'm just showing you, the garden of God with the tree of life was at one time on the earth in the city of Eden. This garden, somewhere between Adam being banished, as you move through the Old Testament, at some point of time, God put it down in the heart of the earth. After the resurrection of Christ, the garden of God with the tree of life was moved up to the third heaven. And guess what? It's not going to stay up there. It will ultimately be restored in its original place on planet Earth. Redemption all taken care of, all satisfied. And it will be right back in its original place in the millennium and in the eternal kingdom. Notice uh, Revelation 2. Jesus tells us again, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, who's he talking to? The churches. To him that overcometh. That doesn't mean you just get saved. That means that you fight the good fight. You overcome your struggles. You overcome the problems that that the devil tries to uh, put in your way and get you to murmur. Get you to fall into sin. You've got to overcome those things. You've got to fight. Nobody can fight for you. They can exhort you in the fight. They can help you. They can counsel you and direct you in the fight. But you've got to be the one that fights. Nobody can fight the devil for you. You've got to do it. And Jesus says, Him that overcometh, Him that gets the victory. And you do it through His power. You understand that? You do it by praying in Him and walking in Him and trusting in Him, fighting His way. To Him that overcometh, says Jesus, will I give to eat of the tree of life which is present tense in the midst of the the paradise of God. What does the word paradise mean? Garden. The garden of God. So, Jesus is telling every believer, you'll get to experience this beautiful garden and eat of the tree of life. It's going to be a wonderful experience, says Jesus. Revelation 22.4 says, 22.14, 22.14, Blessed are they that do His commandments. That's the same as overcoming. Do you see that? He that overcometh, they that do His commandments. How do you overcome? By obeying God's commandments. That's going to be a fight. You understand that? Because the world, the flesh, and the devil want to keep you from obeying God's commandments. They, they, they want to try to scare you away from fighting. But blessed are they that do His commandments. Not man's commandments, God's commandments in the Word of God. That they may have right access to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Guess what? The tree of life is on earth. For without are dogs and sorcerers. That's that Harry Potter crowd. The Wiccan. The people that go to uh, fortune tellers. The people that read their horoscope. The people that go to psychics. See? Sorcerers. And whoremongers. Those are those that have dealings with whores. Those that like to go to movies and watch them. Those that like to surf the internet and deal with them. Those that like to get out of here in public and deal with them. And the women who like to, to, to act like them. Uh, Sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The Lord's saying that all of these folks, 
saved or unsaved, whoever you are, if, if you're doing these things, this is what you are. And the Lord's saying, those folks will not get to participate. They will not have access to that garden. So let's review. The word paradise means garden. The garden of God was originally on the earth with the tree of life. When Adam fell, he was barred access to it and we never found out what happened to it. Well, as you read on in the Bible, Ezekiel 31 and some other verses show you that those trees of Eden, the garden of God, the orchard of God, it somehow or another ended up in the heart of the earth. And guess what? God can do that just as easy as He can create the world to begin with. People say, well, how did He get it down there? What is the scientific methodology by which He caused a bunch of trees to end up down there? We can barely even drill a couple miles down there. How did He get it all down there? Is anything impossible to God? Isn't that ridiculous? God is omnipotent. God can just say the word and everyone in the tree will disappear. They're gone. They were there. Now they're gone. And He did it with people. There used to be some people sitting there saying, this Moses takes too much on him and you know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and God just said, get away from him. So everybody got away from him. They said, well, what's going to happen? The earth opens up its mouth and then it closed back up. Well, at one time, that beautiful garden, the earth opens its mouth and then close back up. So all the Indiana Jones, all, 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 whatever you want to do over there to find the Garden of Eden, you're not going to find it. See? So, so you get over there and do whatever you want to do, you're not going to find the Garden of Eden. But one day, praise God, the Garden of Eden that ended up down in the nether parts of the earth where Abraham was, where Jesus was, where the thief was for three, and a half, uh, for, for three days and three nights, that same paradise was taken up to heaven so the saints can have access to God. That same paradise is coming back with Jesus. Isn't this beautiful? Jesus is going to come back with a city. And in that city is going to be a beautiful garden with the tree of life growing. And here comes this city from outer space coming down with this beautiful garden. And it's going to sit right back where it originally was. And it's probably likely that Eden was the land promised to Abraham. It's probably the same land. And so that beautiful paradise is going to sit right back where it was in the New Jerusalem. And God's telling you this. If you are born again, you will have access to paradise in eternity. But before eternity, there is a thousand year kingdom. And you must overcome and do His commandments or you will not get to enjoy paradise in the millennium. And uh, that means if you don't have access to it, you're going to be where all the other sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loveth and maketh a lie, you're going to be where they are going to be. Which is going to be, uh, he says, I'm going to appoint their portion with the unbeliever, with the hypocrite. Which is, of course, in the heart of the earth. But believe me, it's not on the good side. There's no good side there. It's going to be on the bad side. There's not any tree of life. There's not going to be anything that can comfort you. You're not going to a beautiful garden down there. You're not going where Abraham went. You're not going where Jesus went. You're not going where the thief on the cross went. You're going to the bad place. Which means all of this now puts before us... I like gardens, don't you? And the idea of a garden there... You remember people used to create gardens even in the 1800s over in England and stuff. They would create beautiful gardens as a place to go read and relax. You had your flower. It wasn't just to eat. It was a place to go and wander like the botanical gardens in Fort Worth. And believe me, God's garden is going to be far more beautiful than that. It was a place for you to sit and relax and rest and just enjoy God. Remember, God used to walk with Adam in that garden and how beautiful that must have been. And that's really what makes the garden beautiful. The Lord's going to be there. And He wants to walk in that garden with you, show you the trees, show you uh, His beauty that He creates. That's exciting, isn't it? And so this is just one more thing that you can get excited about that Jesus wants you to get excited about. And um, it's all based upon you, after you're saved, after you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior, keeping the Lord's commandments. Which means, if you were the devil, and I'm glad you're not, but if you were the devil, what would you want to convince a bunch of Christians not to do. 
You'd want to teach them that commandments are evil. Oh, you, you, you don't want to stay away from the word commandment. You don't want to deal with commandments. And you want to get them so confused in their thinking that they end up with this idea, I don't want a religion. I, I don't want to obey commandments. I don't want to read my Bible to find out what the Lord wants me to do. But what did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Is that in the book? That's there, isn't it? And the Lord says, if you will obey my commandments, I will come and abide with you. I will fellowship with you. Isn't that great? So you get a fellowship in this life that other folks don't get. Because you're obeying the Lord's commandments. You get good conscience. You get the Lord dwelling in your heart. It's beautiful abiding in Jesus. Uh, it doesn't mean there's not a fight. It doesn't mean there's not warfare. It doesn't mean that there's not an evil day where you're, you're, you're just assaulted all over the place and you have to fight and you're getting weary. And, and, uh, but I'm going to tell you, those that are walking with Jesus now by keeping His commandments will be those that get to walk in that garden with Jesus, where the tree of life is, where that whole orchard is, where all those beautiful things that are growing in that garden, and that you get the fellowship with Jesus in the kingdom. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you will suffer with me now, you'll reign with me. And part of that reign is fellowship, friend. It's fellowship with Jesus. So we must get serious about God's commandments. And I do not believe that in this age, I believe we're still drunk in some ways, with the Spirit. Even Kingdom Baptist Church, I believe we're still drunk with the Spirit out here that says commandments are evil. And we really don't tremble over God's Word. We really don't get in these Scriptures and feed and find out what does God want me to do? How does God want me to act? How, and I believe we're just far too passive in regard to studying the Lord's Word. And we need to get serious about this Bible. Serious about these commandments. And uh, it's a simple message today. The transportable garden. But... Uh, the Lord is able to do all these wonderful things. And I, I just want to leave you this morning with, uh, with hopefully some encouragement, some exhortation about the Lord's commandment. Let's come out from among these whoremongers. Let's come out from among these sorcerers. Let's be a separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And God says, I'll receive you. But He's not going to receive you defiled with all this mess. He's not going to receive you calling the psychic hotline. He's not going to receive you with these horoscopes. You're going to hurt your fellowship with God by this witchcraft, by all of this mess, by all this sin. So let's not be hypocrites. Let's really learn to hate sin. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my second message, all right? Let's pray. Let's come forward. Christian, come play. And let's get excited about God's paradise this morning. Ask God. Seek the kingdom of God this morning. Ask that the Lord would allow you to enter in. We need to learn to overcome this morning. Dear God, I know what overcome means. It means that we need to get the victory. But God, we know the victory is in You. We know we're called to be strong in the Lord. Oh God, let us keep our rejoicing. Let us keep, Father, this encouragement, this hope that we can. God, we're going to have certain sins that are going to be set up. Certain weights. And it's going to seem impossible to break us, God. But Lord, in You there's power. In You there's victory. And we believe You today, God, that if death could not hold You in, if the grave could not bind You, then we know that resurrection power is given to us right now in this life. And sin shall not have dominion over us. Right now, with all heads bowed, if you'd like prayer this morning, that a certain sin would be overcome in your life, raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. Dear Holy God, these dear people, you know who they are, Father. Oh God, right now, I pray they will believe that they will reckon themselves dead. That the only way the devil can get victory over us is to confuse us and convince us that he still has power. But Lord, I know he doesn't. 
And that we can be strong in the Lord this morning, God. And I pray right now that you take away the temptation in these folks' lives. And Lord, I've seen you do it in so many other cases. Just get rid of it, God. Let them just be still and know you're the Lord. But Father, if for some reason it need be, you lead this temptation and you expect them to fight, let them fight in the blood, God. Please, Father. This paradise is worth it. This fellowship is worth it, God. Let them fight in the death, Father. Fighting against it. And your power. God bless our lives together. Thank you for the dear saints of God this morning. Let us enjoy the fellowship with one another. Bring us back, Lord, to feed on your word, testify and sing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.